Notebook 15, the 296th returns to Champagne. From the 30th of January, 1917, to the 26th of April, 1917. Part 2 Last time we saw how the previously peaceful peace of the Champagne sector occupied by Barthes and the other Palous of his regiment was suddenly rekindled by a single, brutal German attack. Artillery duels and raids intensified, while Barthes luckily escaped a dangerous accusation of dealings with the enemy made by his company's captain. We shall see what happened after that. A few days after Barthes escaped the captain's accusation, on the 23rd of March, at night, a German patrol infiltrated the French lines and captured three sentries. They were about to take a fourth prisoner, but as they were tying a rope around his neck, the man had butted one of the Germans in the stomach and ran away, sounding the alarm. But by the time reinforcements arrived, the Germans and the three prisoners had already disappeared. High command was furious. For the next several days at roll call there were threats, blames, orders and instructions regarding this matter. The colonel demanded that the Palus go out into the German trenches and take some of them prisoner as revenge. An elite patrol was prepared and sent out, but they failed miserably returning with nothing and missing one man who never returned. Barthas wrote that the colonel was asking them to go through an impenetrable mess of barbed wire in absolute darkness, and that only someone as tenacious as a German could go through that with nothing but a pair of wire cutters. Barthas also wrote that during that month of March the weather was awful, with an ending cold, fog, rain and snow. Still, that did nothing to stop the frequent fighting and violent bombardments in the region, all to take a few pieces of useless, broken trenches. Hundreds and thousands of men suffered and died due to little more than the pride of the French and German generals. Due to the increasing frequency of bombardments on the town of domartin Souhain, the French supply column was pulled back to the town of Valmy. The corporals of Barthas's group had to take turns going there to report to their liaison officer. On the 26th of March, it was Barthas's turn, so he headed out at 2 p.m. following the road. He passed by a ruined village called Berzieux, completely abandoned except for one American volunteer hospital installed in an underground shelter. After that sad village, Barthas reached the crossroads and asked the nearby territorial for directions. Unfortunately, the man gave him the wrong ones. Barthas was soon marching on a muddy path in the middle of nowhere when a heavy snowfall began. He completely lost his way and darkness was coming. He was getting very worried until suddenly he spotted the tracks of a narrow gauge railway. He followed the tracks and soon came before a lonely wooden building with a storage dump and a sign which read, Point K Station. There were a couple of territorials inside the station. They informed Barthas that he'd marched in the opposite direction of Valmy. The town was 15 kilometers away. Barthas cursed his bad luck. He had to get there before 6 p.m. to receive instructions from the corporal he was going to relieve. Meanwhile, the territorials invited him to sit by their fire and shared some of their dinner and drink. At around five o'clock, Barthas' bad luck reversed as a trench train suddenly appeared heading for Valmy. Barthas hopped on. As there were no passenger cars, he had to stay on the running board. The empty train moved quickly, and Barthas was thoroughly frozen. He wrote that fortunately, like primitive men, he and the other Poilus had grown insensitive to the harsh weather, so by next morning he was healthy. And so, Barthas arrived to Valmy. He took advantage of his stay there by visiting the various monuments of the Battle of Valmy of 1792, including the place where the famous windmill had once stood, and a monument on a hillock to François-Christophe de Kellermann, one of the French commanders who had defeated the Prussians there. <laughs> 
The monument had an inscription attributed to Goethe, which read, From this place, from this date, a new era begins. Barth has also visited a chapel and funeral mound with an inscription from the Victor of Valmy which said that his last wish was that his heart be buried among the soldiers who gave their lives there. Barthas thought this gesture would have brought little comfort to the dead. And so he spent his time there. One morning the Germans sent several harmless balloons over the sector. Each balloon had a string with a bundle of newspapers and a slow burning match. When the match burned through the string, the newspapers would drop in the French area. Two of these packets fell on Valmy, and no matter all the rules and threats issued by the authorities, everyone rushed to get the newspapers. Barthes himself was lucky to get a couple of issues of the Gazette des Ardennes. This was a German publication for their occupied territories in France. Its popularity had surged since around the middle of 1915, when it started publishing the names of the latest French soldiers that had been taken prisoner. Barthas wrote that there, one could read the names of Palus buried in occupied territory, uncommented clippings of French newspapers, and a few anti-English articles. There was also a picture of a long column of French prisoners taken on the attack of the 15th of March, but for Barthas there was nothing new in that. As always, the Germans also sent many shells over to the French side, but Barthas wrote that, apparently due to respect towards the history of Valmy, they never sent shells there. Instead, the shells occasionally whistled by above the town to crash somewhere two or three kilometers farther ahead. Only once, on the 31st of March, and probably due to a miscalculation, a monstrous 350 mm shell fell two meters away from the improvised barn where the company's mules and the horses were kept. Unfortunately, at that moment, Barthas and his friend Castet were going to visit the mules, and the shell fell a few paces ahead of them. Barthas wrote that by all rights they should have been immediately vaporized, but the ground had been softened due to daily rains and the shell buried deeply into it without detonating. Still, the shockwave was such that Barthas and Castet were thrown violently to the ground, covered in mud and terrified by the horrible shriek of the projectile. It took them a moment to understand what had happened, and Castet almost fainted right there and then when he saw the terrible danger they had escaped by sheer luck. Three quarters of the barn had also been demolished by the shells passing, and many of the terrified beasts fled into the fields. It took the soldiers a long time to find them again. The last thing Barthas wrote on Valmy was that in the churchyard there were several hundreds of graves of Palus who had died in the town's military hospital. Since the railway passed close to it, the cemetery had been covered with tarpaulins and branches to hide it from the eyes of travelers. Right next to this covered-up cemetery, tourists walked into the church to admire its stained-glass windows. Finally, on April 1st, the Poulouse learned the division was going to be a relief. Barthas had to go up to the front line to help retrieve the team's cannons, and spent another exhausting and dangerous night in the trenches with rain, snow and bombardments. After spending all night marching, the Poulouse stopped at a town called Bros saint coye to rejoin the regiment and to supposedly spend a day of rest. Less than 24 hours later, on the 4th of April, the police set out again. No one knew where they were going, though rumors spread that it was to take part in a large offensive. They marched 25 kilometers that day, and 25 kilometers the next, all the while passing by villages which all looked identical and had similar sounding names. At one of these villages the inhabitants pressed forward to watch them pass by. One woman called out, Oh, the poor fellows! When will this life of hardships be over? Barthas wrote that perhaps she also had a son on the front. In that same village, an old peasant with long, graying hair and beard stood immobile as if at attention and held out his cap in salute to the Palouse. He looked into the eyes of each one of them, a look of sadness and sympathy. Barthas wrote that this sincere salute deeply moved them.
at another village, the police saw a chaotic column of children marching through the town, calling the faithful to church. This was how the Poilus learned that it was Good Friday. Eventually, they reached and stopped at the town of Olney-sur-Marne. Here, back in 1914, the Germans had blown up the local bridge during their September retreat, and the locals told the Poilus that the French military engineers had built the new and very sturdy bridge in but 24 hours. Barthes also wrote the Olney countryside was a hunter's paradise, with huge numbers of hares and rabbits. Strict orders were issued forbidding the Poilus from hunting the animals and gendarmes were placed around the place to enforce them. A soldier who was caught with an animal in hand would be forced to give it back and be punished with a month of prison. Barthas's team were lodged in a barn. Barthas himself took up residence in an empty stable stall with a cow and a large horse as neighbors. One day, he discovered that three hens had laid eggs at one corner of the stable. Barthas told his two friends Vidal and Casté of this discovery, and the three of them held a council of war to decide what to do with the eggs. He wrote that if they had been found by other Palus, the eggs would have instantly disappeared, especially considering that the people of the farm that lodged them acted rather cold and unfriendly towards them. But both his friends were honest men, and the unanimous decision was to give them back to the farmers, only asking that they sell them back to them as a favor. The same thing happened a few days later, and Barthas wrote that the proprietress and her daughter couldn't believe their unselfishness. After that, they rendered the three of them all kinds of small kindnesses to the astonishment of their comrades. The three of them kept the secret of the eggs hidden, as the others would have a at their softness. It was later announced that the police would leave the village on the 12th of April. On that day, the police got ready, but at the appointed time an unexpected counter-order arrived, so they earned another day of rest. On the 14th, they again assembled for departure, but again counter-orders postponed it. Finally, on the 15th, they left the village for good. At the end of their day's march, the police stopped at a village called Is to spend the night. As the police prepared themselves to lie down, Barthas found the encampment too cramped for his liking, so he climbed onto a pile of fodder to serve as a bed. Unfortunately, the pile was full of thistles. The spines pricked at his skin and Barthas slept badly. That was his only memory of ease. The next day, the police left for the front lines. The cannons were raging across the front. It was April 16th, the fateful day of the launching of the Nivelle Offensive. For those who might not know, this was a huge French and British offensive planned by General Robert Nivelle to lead a decisive blow against the German army. It involved close to a million men, and Nivelle bragged that it would result in victory in 48 hours, with casualties of only around 10,000 men. After weeks of indecisive fighting, it would end up costing over 300,000 Allied casualties, around 187,000 of those French. The main attack of that offensive was at a ridge crossed by a road called the Chemin des Dames. Here was where Barthas and his comrades were sent. Barthas himself wrote that in this battle the French regiments were decimated, and the first aid stations were flooded with too many wounded to be looked after or evacuated. Barthas's division itself would not be part of the shock troops at the front line, but were instead supposed to act later to pursue the fleeing enemy. On the dawn of the 16th, they were spread along the roads and paths near a village called Vaudemarge. At the crossroads rested a common grave for twelve soldiers who had died in 1914. The Poilus were told not to make themselves comfortable, as they would be heading up to the front to pursue the enemy at midnight. They were Red Nivelle's order of the day, which among many other things said that the hour of sacrifice had sounded and that they could not be bothered by the thoughts of home leave. Barthas wrote that the hour of sacrifice had been sounding every day for the last thirteen months and that home leave was the only thing that occupied the Poilu's mind. The patriotic nonsense in those orders only served to further demoralize the Poilu's,
who didn't think anything would come out of this battle besides more pointless sacrifice. Still, their leaders had convinced themselves that the enemy would be routed here, and they overburdened the Palus with grenades, ammunition, food for days and over four liters of drink without considering if the Palus could even walk with such a load. Many men ended up throwing most of the ammunition and food to the side of the road to lighten their packs, a tremendous waste due to the thoughtlessness of their superiors. And so, at midnight, the Palus headed forward under a torrential rain. They marched a few kilometers on a good road, but then headed off into the fields. Wagons and mules got stuck in the mud while the men's shoes were filled with water. Finally, at 4 a.m. the darkness began to clear and they were stopped at the woods a little distance behind a heavy artillery battery which was firing away. At that very moment, the rain was replaced by heavy snow. Barthas was shocked at the idea of a blizzard on the 17th of April, a time when further south his homeland would be blooming and full of green. Under this snowstorm, the exhausted Palus simply collapsed in groups of three or four under the trees. They were all soaked and shivering. Their superiors decided this was the perfect time to reread over and over General Nivelle's senseless order of the day. Meanwhile, Martha sat down, but the cold was such that five minutes later he made the effort to get up and start walking around to keep himself warm. His stomach ached. He'd only had a light supper the day before. He tried to dig around his mess kit, but his fingers were so numb with the cold that he couldn't handle the bag's buttons. In any case, he ended up discovering that the downpour had soaked and pulverized all his bread, cheese and chocolate, rendering it inedible. Finally, at 6 a.m., whistles started blowing throughout the woods to get the exhausted and cold soldiers onto their feet. They were informed that the first two German lines had been taken. This was the end of trench warfare according to their commanders, and they were going to deploy in open formations. The regiment formed up, and in lines by section, each battalion started marching forward. They were about four kilometers from the front, but had barely covered one when they were ordered to stop. An hour passed, then two, then three, and still nothing. It turned out that somewhere further ahead there was a German fortified position, bristling with machine guns and unaffected by shell fire, which was holding up the French advance in the area. Fortunately for Barthas and his comrades, the snow had let up and no shells were falling in their vicinity, so they continued waiting throughout the day. By the afternoon, after snaking through the landscape, their field kitchens caught up with them, their stew and coffee were gladly welcomed by the Palus. The cooks told the Palus that, throughout all the roads and paths, the supply columns set up for the supposedly imminent pursuit of the enemy had been ordered to keep their mule teams harnessed to the wagons. The poor beasts were wandering aimlessly through the mud and snow with no idea where to go. Night fell, passed, and throughout the entirety of the next day still the supply teams waited for orders that never came. All the while, the mules still harnessed to their wagons. Barthas wrote that their leaders had no space to worry about the suffering of the poor animals and their drivers. Much like the mules, the Pulus also seemed to be forgotten. They spent the freezing night with only their flimsy tents as shelter. For fires, they only found damp green wood, which when burned produced a thick, suffocating smoke. They spent the entirety of the next day again on alert waiting for orders that didn't come, under a heavy rain that easily pierced their tents. The 19th of April came, and still the Palus were waiting in the woods. That day, Barthas witnessed a conversation between Colonel Hobart and a general on horseback who arrived at their position. Colonel, said the general, it's your regiment's turn to move up and attack. Head to the front line immediately. To Barthas' great surprise, the colonel simply pulled his pipe out of his mouth, spit to one side, and said in his gruff tone, General, look at these men and the state they're in. Do you think they don't know they've run into an insurmountable obstacle? The first day they could have marched ahead, but not now, and not me, 
either. Barthas wrote that not many colonels would have had the courage to refuse a command such as this in order to preserve the lives of their men, but under his rude and ill-tempered exterior, Colonel Robert hid a good and generous heart. He was a rare soul. To his additional surprise, the general on horseback did not get enraged at this direct refusal of an order. Oh well, he said, if your men are too tired, go and let them rest in some nearby village. And so, at 3 p.m., the police marched off and arrived with great joy at a village called Setsu, three kilometers away. The town was only five kilometers away from the front lines, but the majority of its houses were still intact, and a few inhabitants remained there. The place had been one of the quietest areas in the sector, and it had previously been occupied by Russians of the expeditionary force for quite some time. Barthas chatted with an old lady sowing potatoes, who told him that for thirteen months not a single shell had fallen on the village, but for the past two weeks they had been shelled almost daily. The day after their arrival, Barthas and his comrades were enjoying a nice evening meal on the pavement of their billet's courtyard when a couple of shells fell on another part of town. As it wasn't near them, they didn't bother to stop their meal. Soon after, they heard that the shell had only claimed one victim, a commandant called Cossé, who had been berating a sentinel. Barthas wrote that Cossé had been an unpleasant senior officer with vague duties who always harassed the police, enforcing petty rules, carrying out mean tricks, and in general making life harder for the soldiers. Just the day before, as they marched into the town, the commandant had surprised a gunner who'd broken rank to go buy a cigar. The enraged commandant ended up giving a week of prison to the gunner and to the non-com who'd been behind him for not immediately closing ranks when the gap had formed. The news of his death did not spark any sympathy. All the worse for him, said one of the police. If he hadn't stopped to chew up that sentinel, he'd still be breathing. Good riddance, that's one less, said another. Barthas wrote that for once death had spared the common soldier and taken the arrogant big shot. Unfortunately, later that night another shell fell right on the roof of the house that served as a billet for a section from the 22nd Company, collapsing the roof and wall and burying three soldiers who'd gone to bed early. If the shell had fallen a few seconds later, it would have killed the entire section. More volleys fell throughout the night, and in the morning the soldiers welcomed with great joy the news that they were evacuating the village. They left in small groups, following a road next to a canal. Close by, they saw the French artillerymen, who during the night moved their artillery pieces up closer to the front to fire at the German rear lines. Soon after, the blues left the road behind and climbed up a hill. They passed by an enormous ammo dump, with thousands upon thousands of artillery shells of all calibers. Barthas wrote that all each new offensive seemed to achieve was make the munition manufacturers richer. A single explosion in that depot could have blown the entire thing sky high, and Barthas wondered at how not a single German shell or bomb fell there, even though it was right below the path of German planes which frequently passed to go and bomb cities and towns further beyond. For Barthas, it was almost as if in this apocalyptic conflict there had been a tacit agreement between both parties to not destroy munitions. At the other side of the hill, the Plus reached and were billeted in a small village called Billy Le Grand, which had great difficulties accommodating their battalion. Barthas's team were given a stable, which was already occupied by some rear echelon horses. The Plus immediately placed the beasts outside to make room for themselves. Barthas wrote that if the horses had had a spark of selfishness, they'd have looked at the Palouse with hatred. But the simple beasts did not even seem to understand what happened, and for Barthas, they were superior to men in many ways. The team's 37mm cannon had previously been destroyed by a shell back in Champagne, and Barthas and his friend Vidal received orders to go to the city of chalon sur marne 22 kilometers away, to get a replacement. They reached the place at 5 p.m. and went to an artillery barracks to search for hospitality. 
They were given a large, empty stable to sleep in, but the men in charge of the matrix were not willing to give them a single bowl of soup or crust of bread. So Bartas and Vidal had to use some of their scarce money to buy a meager supper at a restaurant. When they went out into the city streets, they were surprised to see them filled with rear liners and personnel carrying incredibly decorated capis, shiny shoes, stripes, badges and golden insignia with impeccable uniforms. Dressed like peacocks, they paraded through the streets and filled the café terraces. Barthas and Vidal, with their mud and dirt-covered helmets and greatcoats, felt like vagabonds. Embarrassed, they sneaked along the walls. The next morning, the two Pelus found the depot where they were supposed to get the replacement cannon. Unfortunately, all that was left was a single cannon without a gun carriage. Barthes wrote that a syringe would have been just as useful as that bronze cylinder. Still, the ordnance officer insisted that they take the half-cannon back to their team, as it was the last one he had and it could be a very long time before he got another one. He would send them a gun carriage as soon as one arrived. Resigned, Barthes took the half-cannon. He was very worried about what Lieutenant Loriu would say when he found out that they had gotten such a useless piece. In a fit of rage, and especially if he'd drunk before, the lieutenant could be perfectly capable of expelling Barthas from the gun team, but there was nothing else that could be done. And I think this is a good point to stop for today. We've reached the end of the 15th notebook, with Barthas' regiment being moved around and through countless villages and towns in the sector, the beginning of the brutally pointless Nivelle offensive and Barthes' close calls and worry at only managing to obtain a single half-cannon for his gun team. We shall see what the future holds on the next episode. For now, I hope you all have a good day, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>